Bruchem Aboyim. We are now on the second lecture of marriage. We finished off at our last meeting talking about um, A's and B's. The, uh, the Gemara states that uh, it says even 40 days before a girl is born that the daughter of so-and-so will be married to so-and-so. What we call the Beshert, someone that's destined for you. In English, they call it a uh, soulmate. We, in Hebrew, call it an Ezer Konegdo, a helpmate opposite him. And uh, again, this concept of opposites attract. So how, how, how do we really see that, this connection, even before a person is born? They uh, tell a story of Reb Chaim of Sanz. Uh, he had a study partner who was the son of a very wealthy man. And uh, his study partner, his Chavrusa, had a sister who was of uh, marriageable age, who was very attractive, and again, the daughter of a wealthy man. And um, Rav Chaim Sanz's friend decided that this would be a great shidduch. He was a uh, great scholar, a genius, a very righteous individual. And uh, he felt that this would be an honor and a privilege for his daughter to marry someone of Rav Chaim's caliber. And he had told his father all about the many attributes of Rav Chaim, his study partner, and the uh, introductions were to be made between him and his sister. And his father was really very excited about this shidduch. And so Reb Chaim was brought to the house, this mansion of this, his study partner's father. And um, as they were coming up to the house, the young lady was looking out the window. It seems Reb Chaim of Sanz was a hunchback. And when she saw that, she went to her father and she says, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to marry a hunchback. And she went up to her room and that's where she barricaded herself. She wasn't coming out. And the, the rich man went to his son and said, uh, why didn't you tell me that he's a hunchback? And his son said to him, he's a hunchback? I really never noticed. I was so enthralled with the type of person he was, I really never focused on his physicality. And he looks and he says, yeah, I guess he's a hunchback. And the father said, I mean, you know, your sister's just not going to deal with this. And Reb Chaim heard all of this and he walked up to the father and he said, I understand your concerns, but let me make an unusual request. I would like to speak to your daughter privately. And then after that conversation, I'll be more than happy to leave if that's what you want me to do. And the rich man said, sure, let me talk to her. And with a bit of coaxing, she came down to the parlor. And the two of them were in the parlor alone. And he said to her, there was a large mirror in the parlor, a full-length mirror. He said to her, she said, you know, this is a waste of time. He said, I understand, I understand, but do me one favor, just humor me. Look in the mirror, stand there and look in the mirror, which a beautiful woman has no problem doing. So she went over to the mirror and she looked in the mirror and she immediately fainted. And when she came to, Reb Chaim was there, and he said, what did you see? She said, I saw myself in the mirror but I was a hunchback. And he smiled very softly and he said to her exactly. He said, it had been dictated in heaven that you and I were to be married. You were to be my wife. But you were a hunchback. And I said to God, so to speak, that I knew for you to be a hunchback would be very difficult. So I asked that I should be the one in this relationship to be the hunchback. And you should be perfect. And they lived many happy years together. And this becomes this partnership, this meeting, this connection of husband and wife, bringing the two parts together. And they may not fit any place else. 
It's one of the questions that are asked is, what does God do now that he's created the world? He's created the world. Even though we know he continues to create every second, but still, what does he do? And the answer given, in fact, it was given in the story in the Gemara, that he makes shiduchim. He puts men and women together. Marriages. There was a uh, Gentile woman who heard this, and she thought it was ridiculous. And uh, what she did, she said, I have 200 male slaves, 200 female. I'm going to pair them up in one day. And this is what God does? So she did. And the next morning they came to her. One person killed another, another person knocked out an eye, missing limbs, screaming and hollering. And she went to the rabbi and she said, God, it's God's work. This is just much too difficult to do. So when a husband and wife come together, it's considered to be as difficult for God, and the terminology used, and again, everything that's said in Hebrew has a meaning. It's called as hard as kriyas yamsuf. The word kriya, we talk about the splitting of the Red Sea. That's what this is referring to. When the Jews passed through the dry land with the Egyptians at their back. But the word kriya does not mean split. Very precisely it means to tear. Uh, when a person, God forbid, loses someone, they do kriya, they tear their garment. Now it's very important because you see, if you take a scissors and you cut a thousand pieces of paper, you can put them all together because you cut them evenly and they'll match. But if you tear a piece of paper, it'll only fit with the other part of the paper that you tore it from. Every piece has to fit. Sometimes people have trouble finding their shidduch, their beshert. And I often say to them, you have to be working on you to make sure that all of these jagged edges fit. And until both sides do what they have to do so it fits exactly, it doesn't work. So if it's taking time, either you're not doing what you need to be doing or they're not doing it. But you need to work on yourself. And by working on yourself, you'll work on this union that you're supposed to have with another person. So a wife is called or a husband is called an azer connecto, which again in English we translate as a soulmate. Very simple. Not in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it translates to mean Azer, a helpmate, Kenegdo, opposite him. Which basically means that the only way that someone can be of benefit to you is if they're different than you are. If they're exactly the same as you are, then you just keep going in the same direction. You don't need them. All, there is, all they are is a yes man, helping you to keep doing whatever it is you're doing, right or wrong. Someone who is different, a contrarian, if you will, a different opinion, at least lets you see something in a different light. So that even though you think you must be right, when you hear this other opinion, whether you want to or not, but you hear it, if you're intelligent enough, you think about it. And it doesn't mean you agree all the time. But what it does mean is you listen and get a better perspective. So God puts together the A's and the B's. And as I mentioned the last time we met, you know, you'll have two fish in a tank and you watch one chasing the other and you really want to take it out and throw it down, the, flush it down the toilet. You just feel so bad for the other fish being chased. But if you watch long enough that one fish stops chasing, the other one turns around and chases it. There's always someone chasing someone. So the A marries a B. Opposites attract. But it's not really opposites attract because the A tries to make a B into an A and the B tries to make the A into a B. So nobody... It's not opposites attract. We want to change them. So why don't we just marry an A or a B, whatever we are? But that's not God's plan. What God wants us to be is C's. And it's interesting because C works perfect. Because the essence of marriage is C, compromise. And that's what life's about. To learn to compromise. Because many times the answer is not black and white. It's not always yes or no. A lot of times it's maybe. A lot of times it's that middle ground that works best. In fact, even in Jewish law, in, in secular law today, settling out of court is the thing to do. What we call in Hebrew, pshara, compromise. That better two people compromise, everybody wins, rather than having a winner and a loser. So what we have, it's interesting at a circumcision, the blessing we give 
to the newborn child and to the parents, basically to the parents, we say, today, just like you brought this child into the bris, the circumcision, so should you be have the merit of bringing this child into Torah, marriage, and good deeds. Now, Torah, good deeds, and marriage would, to me, make more sense. Torah, good, Torah, marriage, and good deeds. You would think that good deeds would precede marriage. You would think that's what Torah would bring a person to. So, so why this blessing? Why this order? And the answer is that why, the reason why we follow this instruction manual we call the Torah is for us to become better people, to come closer to God. But through that journey, we benefit by becoming better, more giving people, more humble people, nicer people to everyone, including ourselves. So when we become observant of some sort and we turn to the Torah, this instruction manual, man was created selfish, babies, young children, mine, mine, everything. They want to hold. And, it, and the only thing they like is what someone else wants. They can have a toy sitting in a corner for years. Someone comes over, that my favorite toy. How can you give it to them? It's all mine. Everything has to be mine. And as we try to teach them is to be more giving. And that's what Torah is about. To become a giving person, a better person. And then, but why chupa? Why marriage next? And the answer is that even though you follow Torah, you're still a selfish individual. When you get married, what you learn to do is make that circle a little bit wider to allow someone else in. And the way that other person can be there is through compromise. By you sharing with them, by you consulting with them, respecting them. Then the third thing that we do is, is gemilas chasadim. That is children. That is total nullification. Because to a child, for once in our life, we actually think about something else first. For once in our life, we really, really want someone to be better than us. And when someone says to you, you know, your child is better than you are, all you do is your chest comes out. You feel great. That's not an insult. That's the greatest compliment you can have. You want to compliment someone, compliment their children. They feel truly complimented. So again, so the whole idea of this azer connecto, this helpmate, is to learn compromise and through that marriage come to the point of total nullification. And all of these loves, all of these attitudes that we learn help us to come closer to God. And we have to know that everything that happens in life is for us to find that there's a creator in the world and serve him better. And he is the third partner in this marriage. In fact, it's interesting that the, wor the word for man and woman, ish and isha in Hebrew, Alef Shin, for, in, with, one has a Yud, one has a hey. it's the same word. It comes from the word Eish, fire. That marriage is confrontational. What cools that fire? You can have a passion, but what cools the negativity of it is when God puts his Yud from the Yud K of, his God, of God's name and makes the word Eish into Ish and makes the word Eish of woman into Isha. When God is part of the equation, when the focus is on God and the Torah and the values that they give us, then marriage becomes not only a possibility, but becomes a place of goodness, of kindness, of serenity, of two people working together with a, with a unifying goal. Even though it's not romantic, if a person follows Torah, you can almost be married to anyone because ego is taken out, which is what destroys marriages. There is no ego. Even two books can be in the same place. It's what ego takes up space. It's ego that says, you did that to me? Without ego, then you see a person in a different light. Time runs so quickly. Hopefully we'll continue with this theme at our next lecture on marriage. God bless you all and have a great Shabbos.